Hey guys, Dave from Nerdarchy, four nerds, by nerds, hanging out with a couple of nerds today. And we are going to be talking about Starfinder from Paizo with Owen here, Owen Stevens. And I believe you're the, you're the lead on this project, right? Uh, I'm the design lead. So we, yeah. hi everybody. <laughs> uh, I'm Owen KC Stevens and I'm the design lead for Starfinder over at Paizo. Um, I mean, at Paizo, the, there is nothing that just one person works on if it's more than a page long, right? So everybody works on everything. Um, the creative director and brand manager for Starfinder is James Sutter. So he is doing a lot of the long-term planning and deciding what 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 is appropriate for our iconics. And he's the person that, like, when we have our uh, Ninja Division partners are showing us miniatures and he'll approve those, etc. cetera. Uh, and then there are two sort of champions of products uh i'm one as the design lead and then rob mccreary who's been at paizo for quite a while is the uh creative lead so the two of us sort of take point on making final decisions uh and when i say final i mean unless sutter wants to jump in and tell us to do something differently because he's our boss um but other than that uh we're sort of the twin princes of, of starfinder at the moment and i mean you know we've got jason bullman's was talking to us about starships just yesterday and he did a lot of the starship section and there are still things where we perfectly well know hey this person is an expert on this thing or if it's a 160 page book no one person is going to write that whole thing so i am point person on a lot of the crunchy mechanical decisions um but i would not want to give anyone the impression that i am the high on mucky muck of all stuff well i might want to give them the impression it would not be an accurate impression to suggest that i am the high on mucky muck of starfinder <laughs> oh. Okay, well, thank you for the clarification. Uh, we, us being a company of three and a bunch of volunteers, <laughs> <laughs> we don't have to worry. We don't have to worry about those things so much. Um, yeah, I, I think there are like sixty people at Paizo at this point. So yeah. So if there's a particular thing wrong with any one rule, you're the guy to blame, or we don't like. I shouldn't say it wrong. Well, no, you can say wrong, right? I mean, uh you can make any rules choice and you're going to make one person happy, one person confused and one person sad. Um, the, the, the trick sort of is to try and make sure that you've put the necessary signposts out that, you know, if someone doesn't like a 20 level D 20 class race based game, then we will probably not make decisions in Starfinder that change their mind. Um, what we want to do is the people that enjoy that kind of experience, we want to give them the best version of that experience we can. Now, I think uh, worth pointing out, and I meant to put put it in the description, um, was a link to the game that you actually ran for Ted and um, so, some of the guys from WebDM, Encounter Roleplay, Taken 20, uh, which I will definitely get that in the description for you guys if you haven't checked it out. It, it's, uh, it lives over on WebDM if you guys want to check out that game. And I did actually watch it. Ted stole my spot. Um, I... I <laughs> I listened to it while I was working uh, in Origins, so it, it, it sounded like you guys had a lot of fun. It was a blast. I'll absolutely say that. No, we, we had a ton of fun with that game, um, and that was our the first time that we had taken the final, final edited, sent off to print version of the rules and publicly played it. Because um, one of the things that happens is since we've been working on this for more than a year, I've got three or four versions of the Starfinder rules in my head. Um, <laughs> And I actually probably have to go check the rule book more often than someone who's only ever seen it for five minutes. Because I, I'm like, okay, I know that there are five different ways we thought about handling this situation. Which one did we print? Well, that that's that in itself has got to be a pretty tricky uh, scenario. Now, uh, I mean, it, it can be. Um, one of the reasons we write these rules down is, I mean, I don't want to sound like Indiana Jones's father, right? But I wrote it down so I wouldn't have to remember. Makes sense. Makes sense. That's not the first time I've heard that either. I think I was reading an article, uh, interview, something from Jim Butcher, and he's like, "I turn over continuity of my or continuity of my of my my basically Dresden verse to the fans because they know it better than I do. By the time I've gotten a get a book to publication, it's gone through eight revisions. <laughs> so, which I, I don't know which is which anymore." Right. I mean, that's that's actually a common problem for any creative handling something fair sized. I mean, I I, I played uh, IFGS with Jim back when he was going to college at OU, which is my in Norman, Oklahoma, my hometown. And I remember seeing him 
sitting at his computer pounding out the first Dresden novel. And of course, this is before he published anything. So all of us that knew him were like, yeah, yeah, you're writing a novel. Sure you are. Um, <laughs> turns out maybe we should have paid attention at the time. But that That's back, funny. Back then, right, he had one character, one story, one outline. Great. Um, now he's he's turned into a cottage industry all by himself um and it, it must be very very difficult to remember hey i had four ideas for what i was going to do in this scene which one did i write and for that matter did i describe it in a way that everyone else got the same impression i meant to give right. he's not the only author i've heard do that either um david weber who does honor harrington for example you will frequently see him credit people that are tracking his continuity because He's not so much worried about rivet counting. He's worried about telling a good story and moving forward. But frequently, the continuity of these stories are kind of important for what can this character do at this point? What have I said? What has he done? You don't want to put yourself in a situation where in the third or fourth story, you say, and in an emergency, I can teleport. And then later go, well, it's an emergency. Clearly, I can't teleport, so I'm stuck here. Um, that's a way in which actually I think games sometimes give us an advantage over pure fiction because if I've got an important character, I, I do know what they can do. We wrote it down. We've got words for everything. It's all broken out. Makes it much easier. We actually had Jim Butcher's uh, con continuity uh, manager on, on, on our channel. She also is a cartographer and became, you know, got that gig through him. So if you're ever looking for someone, uh, Patricia Spencer is really good. But uh, basically, like, you know, the, the publisher's like, hey, we need a map. And Jim's like, I thought you guys were going to handle that. And they're like, we thought you were. And he was like, hey, <laughs> Patricia, can you draw this? <laughs> uh, maybe. <laughs> so <laughs> the way best things come. But actually, I think people want to hear us talk about Starfinder. I, I suspect anyway. So what are we actually allowed to talk about? I, I'm pretty sure Ted's not. Ted is allowed to talk about less information that's actually been released. <laughs> Yeah, what I I carefully put Ted in charge of the person who gets to decide what Ted gets to talk about. Um, <laughs> so that's that's not my department, and I mean that literally. Um, <laughs> but you know, I, the, this is a formally approved interview, so by all means, you can ask whatever you want, and then it is my job to know how far I can dance along the edge of saying intriguing things versus giving so much information known by the book. Although at this point. And it's a, it's a multi-hundred page book, so we would not even have time for me to sit down and go through every detail of everything that's in that book so that no one wanted to buy it. Um, our, our hope is that the more we talk about what we have done and what's in it and what's interesting, the more people want it, or at the very least, the more people who are going to enjoy it want it. If, uh, if I note that we've got technomancers and mystics and they are six-level spellcasters in the, the same basic rules tradition as, say, the the bard, and someone goes, oh, I don't want a science fiction setting with any magic in it. I actually am glad at that point that I warned that person that, yes, this is a science fantasy setting. We are combining high science and magic as much as possible on a one-to-one -one basis. So if you are looking to play The Expanse, I'm not saying you can't take a lot of those themes and run those in a Starfinder game. Some of us are big fans of The Expanse. But this is not an effort at a, a sort of hard science with one exception kind of setting. We are taking our facet, our classic fantasy world of Galarian and the, the universe and cosmology we built up around that, and we're advancing it by, at the very least, many centuries and possibly a few thousand years, uh, so that holy plasma cannons are right there in the perfectly reasonable, expected list of things to find. So I guess I want to start with a question from one of our patrons. They had sent it in. Brad Scary. Uh, what distinguishes, other than being science fantasy instead of just fantasy, um, Starfinder and Pathfinder? What would you say the distinguishing factors are? Uh, weirdly, most of the, and that's a great question, the main distinguishing factors, in fact, all come from the fact that Starfinder is science fantasy. Um, Pathfinder is designed to tell one kind of story and create one kind of play experience really well. And that play experience, we can sprinkle science fiction elements in. I mean, there's the Iron Gods Adventure Path, and there's the Technology Guide. And those are things that are designed to allow you, uh, if, for example, you happen to, to have a fondness for uh, expedition to a set of peaks that had a crashed spaceship, 
if that's the sort of classic fantasy adventure that you want to do, we gave you the tools to do that in Pathfinder. But in Starfinder, laser pistols are more common than crossbows. So the rules need to handle laser pistols well, and they only need to handle crossbows as well as Pathfinder handled laser pistols. So there's an entire set of expectation shifts on what the rules need to handle. Like in Pathfinder, we sort of assume that even though we've detailed a lot of player character races, that most groups, unless they are playing someplace far away from the mainstream of what was set up as a campaign, most groups are going to have a lot of humans in them because Galarian is a humanocentric world. Um, that is not nearly as true in Starfinder. First of all, the entire planet of humanity is missing, so there, there just aren't as many of them. But also, the stage, even just our, our core expectation stage, is an entire solar system, the Pact World system. And that has multiple planets, each of which has multiple races, many of which, surprisingly, aren't human. And then we, we even have races coming in from other systems, like the Vesk, who have their own empire, the Vescarium. So when we're writing rules in Pathfinder, we are frequently thinking to ourselves, okay, most likely, if you are playing a Pathfinder character, you are a size small or size medium humanoid with two arms, two legs, and one head. And that is our ex expectation. But one of our core Starfinder races are the Kasatha, and they have four arms. So when we're looking at the rules, we can't say, okay, having two arms is the norm and having four arms makes you a weird exception. One of our core races has four arms, not to mention that we've got rules for cybermetic augmentations so you could add two arms, which means a normal human could have four arms or a Kasatha could have six. <laughs> and, and, and we need to be able to have the rules line things out in a way that, that doesn't break when you have that sort of expectation. Um, and then we've got, we've already announced the Alien Archive. One of the things that Eric Mona has pointed out is that we are trying to make as many things as possible in that book available as player races. So that my running joke is if you're playing a hyper-intelligent shade of blue, the <laughs> rules may well interact with you a little differently than if you happen to have two arms, two legs, and one head. Um, even something as simple as one head, right? If if we create a playable Etten-like race or something with four heads or eight heads or zero heads, then something as simple as a Vorpal Sword cuts your head off, which seems pretty final for most things in Pathfinder, is a much more open question in Starfinder. So we have been looking at those questions and trying to say, well, do we want to do a little song and dance every time we mention Vorpal Swords decapitating someone? Or do we want to still have this condition, Vorpal, which you know, it's it's not like Vorpal has a real-world definition, right? Vorpal is, is from a nonsense poem. Um, but we still want Vorpal weapons, but maybe what Vorpal does in Starfinder, while still sort of horrific and devastating, maybe we don't want to define it just as you cut your head off, because if you're facing a sentient ooze, it may not have a head. We, we had a meeting, uh, me and... Uh, Rob McCreary and James Sutter just a couple weeks ago where we were saying, okay, this species that has been presented that we're writing up is a sentient, translucent, shape-shifting starfish. That's great. That's awesome. There are people that are going to be in on that. But when we say starfish, do we mean that it's wandering around on its lower two out of five prongs SpongeBob style? Or is it flipped over and it's running on the tip of all five or does it ooze along on its back and when we're communicating to the artist you can just say this thing's a translucent starfish and you're gonna get a lot of different things so we're actually doing crude little stick figure sketches and a stick figure starship looks starfish looks a little different from a regular stick picture <laughs> figure those are the the kinds of concerns that cause us to approach the rules differently and then where we find that a rule would work for Starfinder type stories better if it's different from Pathfinder, then we handled it differently. Can, can we stop for one moment? Can we repeat yeah. the part where part of your job is to draw stick figure starfish and distinguish <laughs> the fact that that's different from drawing a normal stick figure person? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, that that is, 
working in the game industry full time is just a little different from most jobs. And I've I've done a YouTube video where I talk about working at Paizo, which is largely a joke, but it's only largely a joke. My very first day at Paizo a few years ago, um, we had a discussion. Do doppelgangers have an innate gender? We've been very clear that doppelgangers can take male or female form, but does that mean that a doppelganger when born does not have a, a, an assigned gender or is there an assigned gender that just switches it at will or, and that's, and so if you're referring to a doppelganger that does not change shape or anything, should we say he or she or it or they, or that's a conversation that we needed to have because we want to present a consistent world. Um, so in I, this I, case, the conversation was how on earth do we even indicate a stick figure starfish? So part of me would love to just be a bug on the wall to see or to, to hear all of these crazy conversations. It sounds sounds no, hysterical. No, Ted, we have to do a parody uh, series where we, we have a wife and a husband, and one of them is coming home from work to discuss our work issues of, <laughs> of, of this kind of stuff. And matter of fact, when you said sixth arm Kasatha, um, uh -huh. I don't even know if I'm saying that right. But when you said that, yeah, the, I, I couldn't stop the six arm the 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 spider Cassandra song from running through my head over and over again, sung by Homer Simpson. <laughs> so, you just have an awesome job. I do. I mean, it, it's it. You guys know fun, neat, funny things that are being produced on a regular basis with money involved. It's still a job. Um, but yes, it is. It is an awesome job, and it's a job I'm. I'm very. I feel very privileged to get to do this. I've been in the game industry for about 20 years. Um, and it's it's just a little different than working at a bank. A little bit, a little bit. Uh, Jeff Van Gogh actually in the chat asked a question I was going to ask as well. And that's, you know, what you know what is your favorite race and favorite class? Pick your favorite um, babies. Well, so unsurprisingly to anyone that watched one of our play test streams, um, my favorite race is dwarf. And that, that takes a little bit of a story, but the short version is that while our core races in Starfinders, the one that we assume that player characters are most likely to be, uh, aren't the fantasy races of Pathfinder. So, so we, we, we wanted sci-fi tropes for our core races. So we still have humans, but we've got Lashunta, who are telepathic and have antenna. <clears throat> we have Sheeran, who are bug folk. Vesk, who are uh, lizard-like creatures. Uh, Yusoki, who are small rat-like mammals, uh, Kasatha, who have four arms. But the book still says, hey, if you want to play a dwarf, half-elf, half-orc, halfling gnome, here are the rules for that. So they're not core, but they're still around. Every dwarf on, wasn't on Galarian when Galarian disappeared. They, they got off that rock a certain amount. So we say, here's what a dwarf looks like. Here are the rules for a dwarf. This is what dwarves are in general doing. Um, uh, there are s dwarven star citadels, which are mobile city bases that they live in. Uh, they have engaged in a second quest for sky because as soon as they got into space, they realized, you know, our God told us to find the sky and we thought we'd done that. But now our cosmology is different. So maybe we didn't do what we were told. We just thought we had. And maybe the reason that things didn't go as smoothly for us after that as we would have liked is that we got it wrong. So several of them are looking out in space in hyper-capable starships for a thing called sky that isn't just the blue color of air. So dwarf is my favorite race. Uh, my favorite class is Solarian. Uh, and I believe we will have a preview of the Solarian class up tomorrow on Paizo.com. Um, sometimes that slides into Saturday, but I believe that's what it's likely to come up. Well, there, and, was a, uh, there was a Solarian in, uh, in, in the, the gameplay. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so people people gotten to see that too. Yeah, that's what I played. Right. Um okay. and the the Solarian is a contemplative supernatural warrior who has learned to tap into the fundamental forces of the life cycle of stars. So their powers are tied to gravity and darkness if it's a black hole and light for a sun and fire and supernovas and even the fact that all life that anyone has found so far eventually traces its life cycle back to the sun. So the power of the sun ties all life together. An amoeba and a human are both dependent on the energy of a sun, of a star to drive them. So, and that, that lets them do all sorts of neat tricks. 
my my idea or my you know my concept when you know people were asking me you know uh, about it, it's like well, it's kind of like a space paladin. That's where my went, mine went immediately <laughs> as well. It did. So, is there any Ted? Any... Did you did you just get a suit? <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, it's it, you can think of it as a space paladin in that it is a warrior with supernatural powers. Um, I sort of think of them as space rangers because being a paladin comes with a certain assumption of of ethical weight okay. and and a solarian doesn't have that assumption right you can be a solarian who's drawing power from the life cycles of stellar artifacts and still be a some bitch who's out to kill everyone and conquer the world <laughs> uh, so a ranger in pathfinder is a warrior who is drawing power from a supernatural connection to nature okay a solarian is a warrior who's drawing power from a supernatural connection to the endless life cycle of stars that are born, burn, and either explode or collapse or slowly fade away. That's, so that's that's something I, I hadn't seen, but that's definitely a, an accurate description. So instead of getting your you know your power from a god or an oath, you get it from the stars. <laughs> it it's pretty cool. Agent 20, uh, 29416, uh, these non-core dwarf races, uh, will they be in the book that's coming out next month? Yeah. The, the dwarf is in the core rulebook. We have a section called uh, the legacy chapter. And the legacy chapter is where we put dwarves, elves, half-elves, half-orcs, halflings, and gnomes. So those those races have a full write-up in the book. Um, it is where we put uh, notes about using monsters from Pathfinder in Starfinder. Because while the books, the rule systems are not identical, they are similar enough that it is not hard to run a Pathfinder monster in Starfinder. So we give you strong guidance on how to do that. The Probably system is be... designed with these. Yeah, the system is designed with the assumption that you can do that. Um, that was going to be then... my next question of like, there's all this Pathfinder product. Uh -huh. um, now, I, you know, you said that the, the laser pistol in a Pathfinder game is the same linkage to a crossbow in Starfinder. Um, you know, if somebody were to take a, a monster from one of the numerous bestiaries that Pathfinder has, is it like a direct, you know, uh, import, or is there like a little bit of conversion that would need to be done? There is a little bit of conversion that needs to be done, um, and and in some ways, I'm the wrong person to tell you how much work that is, because converting okay. monsters is literally my job. So I, I can look at a Pathfinder monster slap it down on a Starfinder table and convert it on the fly because I know both those systems like the back of my hand. The people, <laughs> the people who have done this who aren't professional game designers in general are telling me that it is about as much work as it is to run a 3.5 edition monster in Pathfinder. Okay. So for example, if you take a 3.5 monster, uh, it might have use rope as a skill. And in Pathfinder, we don't have use rope. Now, it's not hard to think, well, that's a skill. I can use the rules for use rope in Pathfinder. So in Starfinder, computers is a skill. Obviously, you're not going to have computers on any Pathfinder monster. If you wanted your Pathfinder monster, if you want a ogre that is in charge of IT, so it is the, the security ogre for your computer, dumb brute that it is, um, or if you oh, really on. want a gorilla. On it. Code it's, re code. it's related to computers. you got to use troll. Yeah, ex well, I was desperately trying not to, but yeah, fine. Um, then it's not hard to say, well, I can see what the skill rank of a of a Pathfinder creature of the CR is. I can use the computer rules. Um, for example, uh, and this is another set of sort of cascading assumption changes. Um, we thought that, that flight packs and rocket packs and jet boots were an important part of a science fantasy setting. So... We did not wait in Starfinder to the level that we would wait to give you those things in Pathfinder. So in Starfinder, you can fly faster, more often, more easily at lower level. Once we've done that, that means that having a whole bunch of different movement skills all be different is eating up a bunch of page count and a bunch of space that will be relevant less often. Um, Especially since once we make fly easier and, and faster, then we want to give you an actual climb speed and an actual swim speed and all those things faster and easier. So instead of having climb as one skill and swim as another, we have an athletics skill. 
And if you are basically doing anything that involves endurance or strength as the primary, that's physical movement, that's athletics. If you are doing anything that is more about accuracy and nimbleness, that's acrobatics. But again, that means that if you take a Pathfinder monster and you want to run it the Starfinder and you're like, well, this thing has a climb check, it's not hard to know, oh, climb is athletics. I will just use the athletics rules. But that is a small conversion. Um, right. We don't use combat maneuver bonus and combat maneuver defense in Starfinder, so but we do use just attack rolls. So you just ignore that part of the Pathfinder monster and you use our attack roll rules for it. We found that it goes pretty quickly and pretty easily. Monster having monster conversion be easy and fast was one of our design goals. We've got six Pathfinder bestiaries, and we are in the same cosmological universe. And with six Pathfinder bestiaries. We've got thousands of monsters, and some of them are pretty cool. But even if we keep releasing Alien Archive-like books every year for a long time, we're not going to get to the colossal CR-17 Plankta. The shattered remains of buildings and statues can be seen in the shuddering mass of wet, rugged rock. That's a cool thing for a Starfinder game. That's in Bestiary 5. We're not getting to it anytime soon. If you, the GM, wants to put a Plankta in your game, we want that to be easy for you. And then as we are, and the Alien Archive has a few things you've seen before, because like a Lich is going to show up often enough, and the Bone Sages of Eox are Liches, so they're a little different. We want to present that and show you how it's a little different in the future, just like our Dwarves have a somewhat different at attitude and, and life cycle because they don't live underground much anymore. They're really up in space. From a, so from a monster... We, yeah, from a monster standpoint, uh, you know, you've obviously taken uh, evolution of the people to a certain direction. Is there anything that either you know of or you had a hand in that the evolution of a monster or monstrous race went in an interesting direction uh, that we're going to hear about in Starfinder? Yes, but almost all of that is an alien archive, and that falls neatly into that category of things I can't talk about a lot. Um, all right. <laughs> there, there, there is a monster in Alien Archive who are native to Golarian, who have their origin all the way back to the Guide to Absalom, which came out like 10 years ago, and I happened to write. And I had an idea for how one of the things I put in Guide to Absalom could have evolved into an entire interesting science fantasy race and that science fantasy race is an alien archive but we haven't talked about it yet so i'll just have to tease everyone that i've managed to have this this 10 year old easter egg that most people won't have any idea where it came from um and that was so important to me i mean i'm busy i, I don't do a whole lot of the writing of the the actual monsters in the monster book i was mostly worried about the back matter stuff i'm um, talking about monster creation and the rules for all of that and uh, some other things we haven't announced yet but I wanted that one to be in there badly enough that when Sutter was like, well, I, I don't know who we're going to get to write this. We'll have exactly the vision you have. And I'm like, okay, James, I'll write it. It's fine. Um, <laughs> You've twisted my arm. I do. Have. Uh, are you able to just uh, list the classes and give the, the Pathfinder a kind of equivalent? Um, so with some I can, and I can list the classes, and I can tell you what they're like. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about Pathfinder equivalent. Um, I mean, the most obvious, for example, is Starfinder has a soldier. Obviously, Pathfinder has a fighter. Arguably, the soldier is the Starfinder equivalent of the fighter. It's not, however, just the fighter with lasers as a proficiency. Um, we have envisioned what being a combat-oriented professional means in the future with modern education and learning programs and the the evolution of real world militaries gives us some idea how past fighting will change the entire thought process um so we handled a lot of that differently and it's got class features like uh you can get gear boosts which give you a benefit with a category of weapons so there is a uh, plasma immolation gear boost that makes it twice as likely you will set someone on fire with a plasma weapon. Um, that does not, while the soldier has a fighter equivalent in Pathfinder, gear boost does not really have a Pathfinder rule equivalent in the fighter. So with that proviso, um, the soldier is obviously our fighter. 
We have the operative, which arguably is the Starfinder equivalent of a rogue, but it's really our espionage agent, hacker, spy, and sniper. Um, and so, for example, there is a trick attack for the operative, which boosts damage, which serves a similar role as the sneak attack does for the rogue, but it works totally differently. Um, and just for, for the people who are asking, how differently does it work? Uh, a trick attack requires a successful skill check, but that's all it requires to pull off. So unlike the rogue, where you are desperately trying to get someone flat-footed or flank them or set up these concrete set of game map rules, with the operative, you have a skill check, and if you succeed at that skill check, then you have pulled off your trick and you get the extra damage. Uh, we have an envoy. An envoy arguably has no real Pathfinder equivalent. The envoy is our leader, tactician, negotiator, and diplomat. And I have seen people refer to the envoy as the equivalent of the bard, but a bard is primarily a six-level spellcaster with a bardic performance that gives ongoing constant set bonuses. The envoy is a negotiator and tactician who has a series of powers that gets to do things like they have a power called get em, and they they will pick a foe, activate get em, and all of their friends now have a bonus to hit that foe until the end of until the beginning of the envoy's next round. So when that's relevant, the envoy can say get him and for one round, and then the envoy still gets to do something. The envoy can still shoot themselves or take some other action. Um, so shooting, the play shooting themselves does not seem like a great option, though, to be honest with you. Well, you I haven't seen all you haven't seen all of the things we have lined up for what can happen to you. Um, no, oh, and I, he was making a joke. A bad one. <laughs> Very bad. <laughs> I, I, I know, but someone has to play the straight man as the guest I thought I should. All right. Um, Excellent. Okay. Uh, we have the mechanic. Or in some ways, the mechanic is our equivalent to the summoner because a mechanic can have a drone, which is a uh, pet type option. So your drone will move around and do what you tell it. Um, again, we had one on the, uh, the streaming game that we played. Um, but... A mechanic can also instead take an exocortex, which is an AI that shares your head and does things like give you a targeting reticule and, and give you advice on hacking computers, etc. So the mechanic is, again, it's a non-spellcasting class, and it is our technology-focused class. You can play it sort of like a summoner in that you can, instead of an Eidolon, have a drone, but that's only one option, and since you don't have spells, your drone works differently than an Eidolon. Uh, we have the Mystic. The Mystic is a spellcaster. Uh, it is our spellcaster that is tied to primal forces of the universe and connections between creatures. In some ways, it is like an oracle or a cleric, but a Mystic does not have to be tied to a god. A Mystic could draw their power from studying ancient runes that explain how various different light forms are all connected, or a... Uh, a mystic could be psychic and take the mind breaker connection, which at, at high enough level actually gives you the power to explode heads. Um, so we Scan did a way scanner style. Was that inspired by scanners? Uh, well, that was inspired by a power in occult adventures and that power was inspired by scanners. So yes, at one remove, uh, you just, you know, you have to be able to blow up heads. That's, that's See, eventually a requirement of science fantasy. Uh, but I mean, we've done away with the distinction between psychic magic, arcane magic, and divine magic, um, because all very few things are actually game mechanically different between those things. We still have different skill, uh, spell lists for different classes, but we got away we we got away from arcane spell failure. In fact, we got away from all components of spellcasting. So there are no somatic components or robo components. Um, it's obvious when you cast a spell because energies form around you and then leap out and hit someone. But uh, you don't have to wiggle your fingers and say weird words because a lot of this action is going to happen in spacesuits in space. And if we had arcane spell failure and you had to be able to hear someone for them to get the words out and they're in a vacuum, that just won't work. So magic in the far-flung future does has, has moved away from the need for those things. Um, and that means that you can decide your mystic is a psychic or draws power from a god, but you can also decide my mystic went to mystic school as a child and, and uh, learned a bunch of mystic knowledge and has, as a result of study, 
ended up with mystic powers. Uh, we also have a Technomancer. The Technomancer, I like, some people think of it as the wizard. To me, the Technomancer is the druid of our setting because druids draw power from nature and the forces of, of the elements. Uh, technomancers draw power from technology and emulate technology and manipulate the same sorts of forces that technology manipulate. So yes, they may well be throwing lightning around like a wizard does, but they're doing that because electricity is a common element of technology. They also can uh, form pieces of technology on the fly and send a, a swarm of nanobots they magically summon at you, etc. cetera. Um, so, and then we have the Solarian. And the Solarian, as I said, I think of it as like a ranger. It doesn't have any really strong equivalent because the Solarian does not cast spells. Um, gets a series of, of powers, and those are all tied to the cycle, and we're actually going to talk about exactly how that works tomorrow, but their resource management is different than any other class I can think of. It is based on attuning yourself to a series of forces during a combat, and the longer you're attuned to those forces, the more neat things you can do, and then some of those powers, when you, you use them, take you out of attunement, and you have to decide, am I going to reattune? And I go into that more detail in the Starfinder preview, but the whole resource management resource aspect of it is different from any Pathfinder class, and calling on the powers of black holes and supernovas is a little different than any other class. So it's the one I think that has the least direct equivalent, even though thematically I tend to think of it as being similar to the Ranger, or for that matter, the Magus, or to in some ways the, the Alchemist, but it's it's a full base attack bonus class that has special supernatural powers. Nice. And that that line of questioning and, and um, you going into that was basically inspired by Godly Darkness was asking about Space Barge. A Bard's agent 29416 was also asking about Space Barge. I'm like, you know what? If we just did the rundown and cover them, Jeff Van Gogh actually has a really great question. Uh, are there are there tools for planet creation like random tables for atmosphere, climate, inhabitants, etc., or is there a list of planets? Uh, we do have a whole bunch of planets. So unlike uh, Pathfinder, the Pathfinder core rulebook doesn't go into the setting of Golarian much, right? It's almost purely just the game, and setting material only gets in there in the form of things like, "Hey, here are gods your cleric can worship," because your cleric has to worship one, so we need to tell you some. Starfinder instead has a strong assumed setting. And that doesn't mean you have to use that setting. If you want to take this and put together your own campaign uh, and, and alter how the rules work and change the names of things, et cetera, you are perfectly capable of doing that. But especially for a science fantasy game, we really felt we had to tell you this is the setting we are envisioning. And that's why certain decisions got made. So every planet in the Pact Worlds, and the Pact World is the same solar system that Galarian was in, although the planet of Galarian is missing. But every planet in the Pact Worlds has a, a spread, a two-page spread that gives you some idea what it's like, who's there, who's running it, um, what's its political situation, etc. cetera. Uh, we also do that for some other planets. Uh, we discussed the Vescarium, for example, all the whole worlds. Uh, the Kasatha have shown up on a giant generation ship called the Idari, and it is standing in for their home world because they don't have a home world of their own in the system. Um, we also talk about various threats that are fairly common issues. One of them, for example, is the Aslanti Star Empire. So while that is a distant, mysterious force, we give you some information on what it's like and, and, and why it exists. And then we also just have a section of, here are some interesting planets. Um, a lot of the people at Paizo who uh, wanted to get involved in this, had the opportunity to, to pitch us. Here is a planet just as a jump-off point for people to have some idea of what are the kinds of weird, interesting things out there. Uh, and then we talk about the sorts of things that a planet might have. So we have rules for zero gravity, low gravity, normal gravity, and heavy gravity. We have rules for regular atmosphere, thin atmosphere, toxic atmosphere. Uh, this book does not I don't think, have random tables to roll those things, but we thought it was more important to take the space to give you, here are all the actual mechanical effects of having a toxic atmosphere, or having a uh, planet that is full of radiation, or um, 
here's what happens if you know a water world and everyone's underwater all the time. So we wanted to cover those things. We may well at a different time do random tables to help people come up with stuff out of nowhere. But in my experience, if you tell a GM, you've got an entire galaxy to play with, you can have any world you want, and here are the repercussions of deciding that you've got a tiny radioactive rock full of poison vapor as an atmosphere, the GM is then empowered to take any idea he has rather than having to, to trust on a random one and translate that into the game system. That That's fantastic. Did you say 180 pages? Of what? Of Book. Oh, no, the book is 500-something. Uh, that's Okay, that makes way more sense. I'm like, there's no way. This book has got to be huge. That no, is- and this, this book has... Everything game mechanically that we put in the Pathfinder role-playing game core rulebook, plus it has a basic campaign setting, plus it has vehicle rules, plus it has a starship system. Now, the most important thing, have you guys uh, determined what size caliber you can stop with this book yet? Uh, We have not. I I tend to think of that as a hero games kind of question. Um, (laughs) And uh, I'm in Washington State, so there aren't necessarily as many people with guns as back home when I was in Oklahoma. Uh, I if and plus we've only gotten preview copies at the moment. We only have our advanced copies, so I don't I don't want to put a bullet in an advanced copy just to see how far it'll go. Uh, uh where are your priorities, I, Owen? Where are they? Look, my 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 priorities were on the second book release for quite a while, and now they are on the as yet unannounced third book release. Um, you know, for a long time we were wondering how much Starfinder ultimately are we going to do. And while we have not made any grand pronouncement that this will continue forever or anything of the sort, because business is business, you have to see how things go. Um, I do think it is telling that my my official job title has changed from developer, which is fairly generic, to Starfinder Design Lead. That suggests we, we expect to design more Starfinder. Excellent. Comic Book University wants to know, uh, can you run a Star Trek style game right out of you know right out of the box? I I suspect you can because that was very much kind of like the game that was run for um, for for Ted and, and the other guys. It was very Star Trek or Firefly ish. Yeah, I mean that's just a matter of setting up your campaign, right? the The starship system divorces your starship from personal character wealth, so it is up to the players and the GM to determine. Where did this starship come from? And if the starship came from, hey, you guys work for the Pact Worlds or the Starfinder Society or Abadar Corp, um, whatever it is, uh, and they have given you a starship and they want you to go explore strange new worlds, yeah, you can do that right out of the box. So one of the things I'm really intrigued about uh, about by the setting is the, the concept of the drift. Uh huh. What, what can we talk about in the drift? Um. So the drift is our take on hyperspace, and the drift is tied to a bunch of different elements. Um, so the, the short form is that this is the same cosmological universe as Pathfinder. So we have alternate planes of existence. So there's an ethereal plane and a shadow plane and an astral plane and heaven and hell and, and the elemental plane of fire, all that stuff. Um, and so prior to, to the gift of the drift, and I'll get into that for a second, Prior to that, people had all sorts of different ways to try and move as fast as possible. So we don't go into details, but I presume, for example, that there were shadow ships with shadow drives that would take you to the shadow realm so that you could fly at less than the speed of light in the shadow realm and come back into the real world and have gone farther than that. But the drift is a specific form of hyperspace that the god Triune made available to many races throughout the galaxy all at once. And it is an alternate plane and you use a drift engine to move your starship to the drift, and then how long it takes you to get to your end destination in normal space is based not on distance, but on the density of drift beacons. And a bunch of drift beacons seem to have existed about the time Triune told people about the drift, and I I am guessing that clerics of Triune go out and, and establish more drift beacons, but the main thing is, the fewer drift beacons there are around an area, regardless of how far away it is, the longer it takes to get there because you have less navigational information to plot a course. As it happens, the most powerful drift beacon that anyone knows of at the moment is the Starstone that is at Absalom Station 
in the packed worlds. So if you are going out to, let's say, Nerdarchy 12, and Nerdarchy 12 is a planet with very few drift beacons, that could take you 5d6 days because the course is difficult to plot and the drift is constantly changing. But then when you go from Nerdarchy 12 back to Absalom Station, even though it's the same distance, that is the most powerful drift beacon in existence, so that only takes 1d6 days. So distance is less important than density of drift beacons, which means the different legs of a trip don't take the same amount of time. The other interesting thing about the drift is that use of the drift tends to grab chunks of other planes of existence and drop them into the drift. Now, the other planes are either infinite or as close to infinite as to not make a difference. So in general, you are grabbing a random chunk of an infinite plane, so chances are nearly infinite that there's nothing of importance there, and you're dropping it off in another infinite plane. But it does mean if you're traveling through the drift, there's a chunk that you'll say, hey, there's a chunk of a brass-looking city that's just sitting there, and there seem to be a few annoyed fire elements. Um, that would be an unusual encounter, but it's certainly a possible one. There was, let's see, okay, com combined question from Jeff Van Gogh as well as Godly Darkness. They want to know, will there be great old ones? Uh, Narlethotep is one of our core 20 deities. We, we set up, here are 20 deities that are the most common deities in our setting, and Narlethotep is one of those be because he's Narlethotep. Um, and in fact, there is a, a uh, an entity, we will say, out on the farthest, most, smallest, coldest planet in the pack worlds that appears to be uh, either a priest of Narlethotep or an agent of Narlethotep, or I suppose he might end up being a form of Narlethotep. There's a mysterious creature and a mysterious citadel on a mysterious planet that has some connection to Narlethotep. So that stuff is in the game. Awesome. So, guys, if you want to, if you want to do your roll call, so we can show show Owen where everyone's coming from and uh, how far and wide we're we're reaching today. We've been hovering around like 45, 55 people throughout the chat, uh, with throughout the chat and and viewing live. So that's pretty awesome, guys. We are so happy you could come hang out with us, and we're it's awesome that Owen's sitting here chatting with us about Starfinder. So. I have played very little of Pathfinder, but you guys, you guys are probably going to suck me in for some Starfinder, to be honest with you. I'm very intrigued with the setting, and the art totally has blown me away. I was so disappointed when uh, Frog God Games launched the Kickstarter, and, and it didn't go because the art was so amazing, and it's totally flavored from all the art you guys have already been putting out. Yeah, and uh, Sarah Robinson, our uh, uh, creative... Visual, I'm not getting her title right, darn it. But she's she's the person who's been in charge of all the art, and she's done a spectacular job with the art and the layout. And we've we've made an effort to try to uh, have specific things tie into uh, how to get visual information to people. So the book is gorgeous. So we we have Ted. You want to do the roll call? Uh, I'm not in there. Oh, I'll get it then. We got Andrew in Fort Lauderdale, uh, Florida, Fluffy, Tengu, Travis City, Michigan, Godly Darkness. Um, uh, you're not saying where you are. You're just <laughs> adding. <laughs> uh, Jonathan Sweet, Ohio, uh, Seattle with Owen, Uncle Peter, Toronto, Mr. Man, Huntsville, Alabama, Rogelio, Utah, Jeff Van Gogh, Luxembourg. We got Richmond, Indiana with Godly Darkness. There you go. Eureka, California with uh, Kirkish 001. We got Ben from Grand Falls, Nebraska, uh, Canada. We got uh, Noxim Noximus Jamaica Miss. Uh, you're not saying where you're at yet. We got New York with Wilder Smith. We got Robbie Thomas with Austin, Texas. We got Agent New Mexico, Matthew Zelensky, uh, Tucson, Arizona, uh, Fernando Q, San Nicolas. Uh, De Lasso, uh, never mind, Mexico. <laughs> he's, he's coming to us from Mexico. Sorry, guys, you know I can't talk. Jose in Tampa, Florida. Uh, Nico in Ohio. We got Andrew in Baldur's Gate. Likely story. Um, we have Party Wipe Gaming, Phoenix, Arizona. <laughs> Arnando is coming to us from Nerdarchy 12. We have Mar Montreal, Canada in the half with 
Canada in the house with Dem Sauter. We've got Ryan Miller with Kalamazoo, Michigan, but I'm re relocating to Nerdarchy 12, uh, Comic Book University, Nerdarchy Prime, Reno Smith, Ellicott City, uh, Maryland. We got Knoxus, Jamaica, uh, Kingston, Jamaica. And we've got Burlington, Washington from Celts. So we got people uh, coming from all over the place. Where's my Sweden at? I know you guys are out there. Uh, so uh, that's pretty awesome. So we're getting right to that time where we'll be ending within the next five, ten minutes or so. Uh, is there anything you want to leave people with? Um, we we know that a 500-page role-playing book uh, can be a bit on the intimidating side, right? I mean, you can you can break someone's hand with this thing. And the Pathfinder role-playing game is quite rightly pretty well known for not giving you a lot of hand-holding on how to play a role-playing game or make a character or get involved. Um, and that is a, an artifact of what the Pathfinder role-playing game was designed to do, what that core rulebook was, was for, and the environment it was released in. With Starfinder, we have made a much, much stronger effort to make it gentler and easier to get involved. And if you already know everything you need to know about role playing and D twenty based games, you can skip that stuff and leap in. But we did take, for example, character creation and put it in front of a bunch of people who had no involvement with Starfinder prior to that, and say, "Hey, can you make a character?" And I'll be honest, the first time we did that, it was a disaster, and they resoundingly said, "No, we cannot make characters. We don't get it." Um, uh, Amanda Hammond Kunz, uh, in particular just did a Herculean effort to go back and make sure that everything was as clear, concise, and and stair-stepped as possible. So if this book looks interesting but frightening to you, pick it up, give it a try, read the example of play, for example. We made an effort to make this something that, that hopefully, if, for example, you've got friends that are geeks but not role players, maybe this is the thing you can use to get them into the hub. Or do what I do and sucker someone else to reading the rules and show up for the game and be like, this is what I'm doing. Tell me what the role. The, you know, that is a, a really, really common way to role play. And there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, I ran a role playing game for a while for Mercedes Lackey. And basically she told me what she wanted her character to be. I wrote her character up. And then while we were playing, she'd be like, I want to do this. Which die do I bounce? Because she didn't care about the game mechanics she cared about telling a story and and having fun with her friends and and doing interesting stuff so if you can get someone else to know the rules and just tell you what to do that's great but we're trying to make that process easier this time around which is awesome like i said the the book looks gorgeous heck i don't i don't even know if i play it but i'm totally buying it because i need i need that book in my life for some reason <laughs> no well, I, like, I, I i suspect the, there will be nerdarchy games of starfinder going on the, the GM screen art is just gorgeous, and I, I am very tempted to just put that thing on my desk so that I have a physical uh, desktop, right? Here, here is, instead of my computer desktop, I'm actually putting this on my desk, so I've got this art to look at all day. Just frame it. Just frame it. Put it on the wall. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Maybe, you know, the, the top is open, so you can just slide it out when you need it. So, um, what... What is the one thing in this book, if there is one thing, that you're the most proud of putting in here? That you're like, this is my baby. I made this happen. It was a, it was something you needed in this book. I, it was crucially important to me that it be possible to play a divinely inspired warrior of good in heavy armor with a holy plasma cannon. That was important to me. Um, <laughs> And that was not quite as easy to arrange as you might think. But when we announced this at PaizoCon last year, and people said, what's one thing you can promise me will be in this game? I said, holy plasma cannon. So, yes, you can have a holy plasma cannon. And if you're going to be facing demons and devils and dragons, you want a holy plasma cannon. Well, come on. Who doesn't want a holy plasma cannon? Just across the board. Well, but there, might, there might be people who prefer vorpal machine guns. <laughs> but the question is can we get a holy hand grenade uh technically yes you can absolutely get a holy hand grenade it's a sort of horrifically expensive use of the holy ability but you can do it and when you do thou shalt count to three only if you get it in antioch absolutely 
<laughs> so, so was there anything that you guys butted heads on with it going into the book? Well, there's a ton of stuff we butted heads on. The, the, they moved me and Rob McCreary to be in the same small office so they could close the door when we were arguing. <laughs> um, and poor Jason Keeley had to be in there too because we needed a place for his desk. So. I, I'm not kidding when I said at one point we were making decisions by rock, paper, scissors if after an hour we had not come to a, a, a decision. Um, recently, rock, paper, scissors was outlawed, and instead decisions are now settled by uh, having a Lego K2SO and a nun box, and whoever wins, wins. Oh, man. <laughs> Sutter put a picture of that up on, on the internet, right? We've got the boxing nun and, and the K2SO going at it. Oh man, that's pretty amazing. <laughs> like I said, we need to do the parody where we we need to like we need to like just pick the ind all the industry brains of like the crazy stuff that they've had to like you know discuss, argue, <laughs> figure out at work, and just do like the couple talking about their day at work afterwards. <laughs> I think that would be hilarious. So uh, we want to thank you for your time and coming on. We really do appreciate it. It was awesome having James on here last time. It was great hearing hear, hearing your side of things as well. I really am looking forward to this book. I believe I have it pre-ordered already. A lot of people do. And uh, there, there's a link down in the description, guys, for you to go check that out. Um, I want to thank everyone out, everyone for hanging out with us. Of course, as usual, we have to do the customary until we go out to LA panhandle the internet where our fun go, our GoFundMe is still going on right now. We can definitely afford plane tickets and we can get out there, but we may be sleeping on the sidewalk. Uh, <laughs> Fortunately, it's warm out there, so we should be okay. We should survive. Uh, we will just have to keep watch to make sure none of the recording equipment gets stolen. Uh, thank you, everyone who's already given. Uh, if you haven't and you can, please do. If you can't or you've already given, please donate. Uh, every little bit is going to help us get out there to be on GM Tips. And we got some other cool things planned that we want to want to check out as well. So uh, I just want to you know thank everybody so much. And until next time, guys, stay nerdy. Stay nerdy.